Hey, what's up, everybody? We have a new YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe right now. Leave a comment on the video. Share it with your friends. It's also a podcast. Three and out. Wherever you listen with me, John Middlecoff, Apple, Spotify, we have you covered. As well as thevolume.com. We have merch. Check out. I got three and out hats right now. Thevolume.com. Search the podcast. Buy some merch. Okay, Middlecoff mailbag. Add John Middlecoff. Fire in those DMs. Instagram, wide open. Two Fs. Longtime listener. I heard you and Colin talking about Dion's son, Dion's comments with respect to his son, Shador, and Travis Hunter essentially controlling their own fate in the 25 draft. I'm a Cowboys fan. I went to school with Dak and have been following the team long enough to now to have a good sense for how Jerry and the front office will operate. When I heard Dion's comments about wanting to go to quote unquote certain cities and nowhere cold, I immediately thought of Dallas. Jerry loves the bright lights and of course his personal affection for Dion. With Dax potentially hitting free agency next year and their likely lower first round draft slot, what are your thoughts on the likelihood of Shador to Dallas? Here's the thing with Shador Sanders. Obviously, early on in the season, he's talented. He's got a big arm. He's a good athlete. Comes from incredible genetics. I mean, he's... But, like, as the season went on, and we could argue their O-line sucked, and they have made a change of coordinator. There was a lot going on. Like, to me, he is not some elite prospect right now. He's an intriguing prospect. Anytime you're an intriguing prospect, you don't get to dictate the terms of where you go. This is not the NFL. Or excuse me, the NBA, where team, you know, agents and players have been doing it forever. The NFL never operates like that. It's it's happened twice, kinda. I mean, ultimately, the Chargers got Phillip Rivers and some picks, right? Or no, that was that Drew? Yeah, no, it was Phillip Rivers. So I, I don't know. I, I think we're so far away. Let's just see how the guy plays this year. Let's see how he plays, because. The colder weather cities, like, isn't he playing in Denver? That's why I told Colin. Colder weather cities, isn't Denver freezing cold? Um, I think sometimes, you know, in Dion's perspective, Dion's an all-time great. Dominant, elite, ass-kicking player. Could have played any era, anytime, anywhere, and dominated. Like, is that Shador Sanders? Maybe it turns out to be. But it feels like he put a lot of pressure on him. Now, I, they like the pressure. I get it all. And I, I'm I'm pro Dion, Because for all the talk with Dion, Dion's old school, which I appreciate about. But I, I do think it's a lot of pressure to put on your son when your team, I mean, is your team any good? Because if your team's not that good, it's very challenging. The Dak situation, it's definitely a possibility. But I guess we'll see over the next, I don't know, couple months. Like, do they get a formal agreement or not? Do they just play the season out? Because if they just play the season out, then it's definitely an option. Question for the mailbag. Do you think Lane Kiffin ever gets another shot in the National Football League? Seems like he's matured. Or do you think he would leave for Bama and he's just content at the college level? It's a good question. He makes about $9, $10 million at Ole Miss. And he's turned them into a juggernaut. I mean, they're winning double-digit games. I saw something on my social media feed the other day. He he thinks this is going to be one of their most talented teams. He's crushed the transfer portal. Uh, the Bama thing is clearly gone for the foreseeable future. You know, I, I think Kalen Dubois is getting three years at minimum. So, you know, the, the job was just open, and it didn't feel like they wanted Lane. So to think that I would never say never, but to me, Lane Kiffin – probably is more likely to get LSU if Brian Ke- anything weird would ever happen there. And let's face it, Brian Kelly's going to have pressure next year. I know he had the Heisman Trophy winner, but he went 9-3. and three. In Florida, if Billy Napier doesn't win, he's getting fired. And to me, if you're Florida, this guy's killing it in the SEC. I think they would be all over Lane Kiffin. I wonder if Lane's just made for college. Like it just works for him. He's good at the transfer portal. He's good at social media. You make so much money now. 
I kind of, if I was a betting man, I, I think he's just in the SEC for a while. And I, I think you would, I, Florida is the most likely place if Billy Napier's fired. How, how do they, who who would they want to hire over Lane Kiffin? Especially if he wins 10 plus games again. It's like, this guy's doing this at Ole Miss? What do you think he'd do for you guys? Do you think the Bills can still win the AFC East next year? The last two seasons, the Dolphins had four game leads and blew the division. That being said, the Bills lost a lot of key players and leaders in the locker room. What are your thoughts on how the division plays out? I haven't looked at the odds yet, but I would bet on the Bills. I would be stunned if the Bills don't win it. Patriots are going to be god-awful. The Jets, I mean, just got a lot of issues nonstop. And I'm sorry, the Dolphins are just dramatically worse. They, they just are. I mean, they lost their best second-best player. I, I just... This is the Bills division until they don't win it. How could you bet against them? And I know you guys have some holes. You have the best quarterback by a country mile. I mean, Aaron Rodgers is kind of an unknown right now. But Josh Allen compared to Tua, it's like having Steph Curry compared to, like, I don't know, the 18th best quarterback. Or, I mean, what point guard. It's not a fair fight. The advantage you have with that quarterback over the Dolphins, who are clearly the second best team in the division, I would say it's pretty wide. Here's a question. Tomorrow night, I'll be I'll be going to a baseball game at the Tokyo Dome while on vacation here. Are there any international sporting events you've been to or want to go to? Very excited. You know, a good friend of mine, Brian Hawkins, who played baseball at St. Mary's, the, the school that makes the NCAA tournament in basketball, one of his good buddies uh, who he played with in school was like a fringe AAA guy got a couple year contract to go play in Japan and him and some of his friends or some of his teammates went to go watch Kyle play and said it was one of the coolest experiences he's ever been a part of. This guy's been to SEC games, been to big college football, like he's been to other events. And so he's never seen anything like it. The Japanese baseball game, like the high level of it, I guess one inning, everyone blows up a balloon and they all let it go at the same time. They go to the top. So I, that'd be an incredible experience. I would say would love to see the All Blacks play in New Zealand. Um, I'd love to see a big EPL game, right? Manchester City versus Manchester United or, you know, some of that action. Uh, I haven't really thought about it. I, I would love to go to the British Open, the, the golf tournament at St. Andrews specifically. That'd be pretty sweet. But enjoy it. That's... That's a cool life experience. I would love to go to Japan. I, I've heard incredible things about Japan. It's clean, safe, great food. It's just an awesome place. Right up my alley. Born and raised KC resident and fan. We have it so great right now, and I'm living in a fairy tale. That you are. Podcast question. When you sit down to record, I'm curious what your process is start to finish. What software do you record on? What camera are you using for such high quality? Uh, well, I I have a notebook. And before I've pressed record, I've, I've obviously kind of put together a show of what's going on. I also have like kind of a running thing on my phone in terms of topics and angles and things that I want to talk about. So I, I don't just freelance once I hit record. So it's it's I spend, you know, I mean, in sick way every day, every hour thinking about it. And any idea comes in, I throw in. Obviously, certain days are easier than other days. Uh, in terms of recording, we have a pretty big setup here. I uh, My guy James flew in from Jersey, who is producer here on the show, and set it up. We got a Sony camera. I got this fancy mic. My production in terms of before I send it off to my people I just recorded on GarageBand. So, but the ca the cameras, I think, pretty expensive high end Sony camera. They're just staring right at me. Got a lot, a lot of chefs in the kitchen here, figuring this thing out. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known what to do before that. I just had one of those like twenty eight dollar Yogi's. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here, and DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top rated sports book apps is giving new customers a shot to turn five bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. 
North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JOHN, J-O-H-N. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JOHN. The crown is yours. I'm a big fan of the podcast. Appreciate your rants with Colin. I'm a Saints fan who got into the NFL in the first season of the breeze Hayden marriage. Good time to start. All I've known is high level. However, I've been so disappointed in the team's willingness to settle for mediocrity since the end of that era. I was out on Derek Carr signing from day one and can't believe that Dennis Allen still has a job. What on earth are they trying to achieve? I'm also disappointed with Mickey Loomis, as I imagine he'd know better than settling for mediocrity. Me and my girlfriend are currently searching for a rental in a town where the demand is much higher than the supply. It's challenging. The other day, we could have taken an apartment that was kind of okay, but far from ideal. Decent kitchen and living room, but zero storage space and no window bedroom. Later that day, I asked myself, if taking this apartment would be like the Saints settling for Derek Carr. I know that it would be the most mediocre thing to do. I also asked myself, if I was an NFL GM and I was given the option of having Carr as my 100% guaranteed quarterback or a coin flip, would either land me Patrick Mahomes or Zach Wilson, which would I take? Well, obviously, I would flip the coin. So I said no to the mediocre apartment, and now I'm left asking myself why the heck the Saints choose to do it. I I, I think the difference in apartment hunting is, I don't know exactly where you live, but there are going to be a lot of options. Even if, like you said, the demand is higher than the supply, there are just going to be a lot of places you can find to rent out, whether it's apartments, maybe a condo, maybe you can find some cheap house. So guys, like they're just uh, with quarterbacks they're just, or not. And I guess what you're arguing is the, the thought of the unknown is better than knowing you're get an average at best player. The problem is in the coin flip analogy, like Patrick Mahomes isn't an option. So you're really looking at the coin flip. Would I flip a coin to just get a guy better than Derek Carr? Well, free agents, none of those exist, right? And in the draft, I forget last year, you guys didn't even have the pick. That was part of it. Didn't the Eagles have your draft pick? Am I off on my ears? I'm pretty sure the Eagles had your draft pick, right? If the Eagles didn't have your draft pick, maybe it's a different story. But I, I do think that had to play in the, to the fact. So I, I think they're simply looking at it like, could Derek Carr get us to the playoffs? And let's face it, that'd be a successful season. Clearly, answer year one's no. I, I, I do think that you should be more hopeful this year given the Kubiak signing. I just think your offense could be better. My guy Keith Williams, the wide receiver coach, is really good. So, like Derek is what he is. When he plays really well, he's probably the 12th or 13th best quarterback. When he's bad, he's in the 20s. So can you just get like the 13th, 14th best quarterback out of him? And can you win 10 games? That That's what... The Bucs figured out with Baker Mayfield. I feel you, though. Sucks. No one wants to watch a team where you feel like you're just kind of spinning your wheels. I think the other problem is when it comes to quarterback situations, a lot of teams are scared scared of the unknown. A lot of teams are scared of the unknown. And that's where your coin flip. Are you better off? Sean Payton was not. Like, just get Russell Wilson. We'll figure it out. Sean Payton has more confidence than, let's face it, Dennis Allen. Just use the game time code. Use to get some Orioles tickets for the opener. Have a good one, bro. You know the thing with uh, the Orioles, I think they're pretty good now. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the Jags free agency spree and our upcoming draft needs. We're light on media coverage. I'd be lying if I knew your roster that well. I don't. Uh, the, The two free agent signings that come to my mind Gabe Davis, which I saw Doug talking about at the uh, owners meetings, obviously, you know, big body can run. He's made some big plays over the years for the bills. It's a guy that's used to being part of a winning operation. I totally understand that signing. And I clearly they signed him knowing that like Calvin Ridley was kind of on the fence. Makes a lot of sense. Good signing. I I like that signing. Uh, 
the Eric Armstead one, I get it, right? You keep doubling down on your defensive line. He's a really high character leader, comes from a winning operation, a lot like Gabe Davis. So if you just look at it like, if we get the most out of these two guys, we're not getting these guys from random teams. Like these guys have been used to going to the playoffs every single year. The thing with Eric, he just can't stay on the field. He just, he's had plantar fasciitis. He's had knee issues. He's, he's huge. The one thing with Armstead, he's not like the biggest guy in the NFL in terms of weight. He might just be, I mean, just when you stand next to him, there, there can't, there has to be a short list of human beings that feel bigger than Eric Armstead. He's fucking massive. Six, seven, 300 pounds. He's got to be one of the best looking guys getting off the bus in the league. Trent Baalke drafted him, so it wasn't really shocking. If they keep him on the field, positive addition. If, if he can't stay healthy, which sometimes older <clears throat> linemen struggle with, it's going to be a problem. I've become what seems to be a three times a day now, daily listener. However, however you plan your content, you truly do it in a perfect way, how I consume my day. First, with the Otani News scandal breaking, it makes me wonder if league officials feel like the direction of gambling has taken sports as less, more, or the exact public headache as they expected. Are they just waiting for an old school minds in the public to change and not be concerned, or do they think generally fear a game shattering gambling scandal? Well, there's still a lot of unknown in the Otani story. One historic story with gambling has been players on the take, right? Like back in the 20s, it happened in college in the. I remember watching the Netflix documentary, I think in the early nineties at Arizona state, one of their star players, you know, was, was, he wasn't throwing the game. He was just making sure the spread was either covered or not. In the NFL, in basketball, in major league baseball, do you know how much money these players make? Right? So the star players, you you couldn't buy LeBron James, Steph Curry, Otani, a player that makes 30, 40, 50 million Mahomes, they make too much money. Well, what happened in the NBA? A two-way contract guy was hammering his unders. Yeah, he'd be the small percentage of the type player that I guess you could buy. Even in football, with the prop bets, you can't, like if I'm a, a random running back, I don't control how many touches I get. So there's nothing, or, or targets I get. I guess I could drop a ball on purpose if I was a wide receiver, but in the NFL, you might get cut. So I think football has to worry about that less. You know, the NBA with the player props and just some of these shitty teams that have these two-way players making no money. But even a two-way player in the NBA, what are you making, a million bucks? And he's like giving his buddies heads up for unders for $10,000 bets. Now, the referees are always something you have to keep an eye on. Because anytime I can get a guy making a couple hundred grand, well... What if I can give him 50 grand? 50 grand to most pro athletes in the major sports is not much. But to a ref who makes 175 or 225 grand or 100 grand might makes you think. So to me, the referees and the umpires are the guys that you have to keep an eye on. I'm less worried about the players, definitely not worried about the coaches. I, I do think with the players, you know, Calvin Ridley got caught. He got suspended for a year. The dude on the Raptors, Porter, Michael Porter's brother, like he's going to get banned for life. It's just not worth it. But I do think the referees, they're someone you just have to keep close, close eyes on, really. To me, Otani, I don't know if he was betting or not. I mean, it kind of feels like he probably was. Maybe he was getting robbed. I, I just don't care. <laughs> I really don't. If you told me he bet against himself on games he was pitching, I would acknowledge like that's pretty crazy. But unless that comes out or betting on the Angels, I just I can't pretend to care. I, I really don't. And this notion I've heard so many people say it of like gambling ruining sports. There's I heard Bill Simmons talking about it. There's been gambling scandals forever. We gamble, right? In every facet of life, people do. Athletes do. Businessmen do. Not just on sports, on life. If, if you put money in the stock market, you're kind of gambling. If you're gambling on, if you're betting on games, you're taking educated guesses. I'm a free society guy. Get to do what you want. 
Obviously, if you work in an industry, there are regulations, right? You can't inside trade. But I, I'm a big believer in like, yeah, people are going to make mistakes. Most people that are breaking the rules or laws, like kind of know what they're doing when they're doing it. Like not many of them are like, yeah, I was kind of naive to the fact that you know, they know what they're doing. So I, I just, I'm not as phased by, oh, the gambling. Oh, it's so accessible on your phone. I didn't know this. Colin said, the average bet's $4, you know? Most people aren't betting that much money. 